Yes. You can go ahead, sir. Thank you, Mary. Welcome back, everyone, from your break. Um, as Mary said before, my name is Andrea Fowler. I'm the Assistant Director at the Center for South Asia, where I am the Outreach Coordinator. Um, I also help coordinate foreign language and area studies funding. So if that's something that you're interested in, um, you know, having a little extra money to study a language in South Asia or Southeast Asia, come talk to me. I'm happy to help explain to you how some of those processes work as well. So. Um, it's been my pleasure to work with Mary and Jeff on coordinating this event and with Jessica from Asian American Studies at UW and I hope that you are taking as much away from this event as I already am and we had a fantastic way to start our day and I'm sure that it will continue. So it is my pleasure to introduce to you Stephanie Taylor. Stephanie is the Refugee Wellness Coordinator at Jewish Social Services here in Madison. Stephanie joined JSS in the fall of 2021 after spending time volunteering at Fort McCoy with the Afghan refugees who had come to Wisconsin. And this experience prompted her to realize that working with refugees was incredibly important to her and she wanted to get back to her social work roots after spending some time pursuing other activities like raising a family and working as a lactation consultant and getting her family established. Stephanie earned a BA in Women and Gender Studies from Washington University in St. Louis and has a Master's in Social Work from the University of Chicago. She also has an MBA from Babson College. Stephanie has worked in a variety of nonprofits where she has spent time in programming and development and direct service. At JSS, she works on the resettlement team and she's going to talk to you today about some best practices for supporting refugees through their resettlement journey specifically in relation to education and wellness. She'll explain a little bit how Jewish Social Services helps to resettle clients and what their journeys look like to get here, including the way that many of the Af their Afghan clients have come to Dane County. She'll also give you some resources and some suggestions for ways that you can offer supports to students or families in your classes and your communities. So I don't want to give any more away. I want to let Stephanie do the talking. So please help me welcome Stephanie Taylor. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I want to start by just saying that I, so I started in this work, um, in, like mentioned in August of 2021. My coworker was supposed to come with me today who is from Afghanistan, he couldn't make it. I'm from Chicago, it's not quite as interesting, so I'm sorry. But I am really, really passionate about the work we do and I'm, um, it's really important to me to advocate for our clients. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about that. I first have a question, has anyone, so I know you're all educators or most of you are, worked uh, in your school districts with any um, Afghan families this past year? Okay, great, cool. Um, all right, so. I'm going to talk a little bit about the resettlement process because I think it's important to understand before I get into working with um, the Afghan clients we have in, in the school systems. So, these are the topics. I'm going to start by giving you a little bit of an overview of Jewish social services. Um, so we are the only agency in Madison that does refugee resettlement. Lutheran social services used to do this also, but they don't do that anymore here. So we, we do, despite our name, we help the whole community, not just people that identify as Jewish. And we actually offer quite a few services, case management for seniors and others, senior adult programming, refugee resettlement is a big part of JSS, chaplaincy, and in the past we've had immigration legal services. We're currently working with um, CMC and Silk to provide those, but we are hoping to get it in-house again at some point. So we do a lot. I also want to say that before, um, is this still working? Okay. <laughs> I don't often talk with a microphone. So, uh, Before the Afghan crisis last year, due to politics, um, you know, immigration was really limited for a while. So what happened was all of these agencies were downsized and no one was prepared for what happened. So I was like the third person hired on the resettlement team and now we have 10. So we've, we're finally full staffed, we can do a lot more. 
Um, but it's been a lot of work for not just resettlement agencies, but schools, everyone involved in helping our clients, not just from Afghanistan, but there's been a lot that's kind of changed in the last year for how everything operates. So important terms and definitions. The one that's really important to my talk today is SIV because that's how most of our Afghan clients are here, special immigrant visa. It's an expedited resettlement process, usually used at this past year for Afghan nationals mostly, who worked with the US Armed Forces or State Department, often as interpreters. Um, the reason I think this is important, so for refugees, oftentimes refugees are waiting for 15 years to come over to the US. There's so much paperwork, there's a lot, there's a huge process. So there's like years and years. Kids are raised in refugee camps. Um, there are about 30 million refugees in the world right now, half are children and less than 1% will get to immigrate to a country of their choosing. So just an important context, the way that the Afghans came here was very unprecedented with the numbers. No one was prepared, they were not prepared. I mean like three, you know, one or two days, like let's go, let's gather everything we can carry type situation. Uh, so it was very, very different and I believe it was about 80,000 people that came to the U.S. and across all the different safe havens, and one big one was in Fort McCoy, almost 13,000 Afghans were sent there. And I volunteered there through Catholic Charities, which is how I get back and got back into social work. Um, so that was only about an hour and 20 minutes away from where we are today. So it was a very interesting experience. Uh, and I just want to share that even though I'm talking a little bit more about the Afghan perspective here with education, a lot of our clients come from these different areas. Right now, DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo, is where we have a lot of clients coming from. Swahili, Kenya, Rwanda speakers, Syria, Afghanistan, and you know other countries too in the past. But right now, those three countries I, I mentioned first are where we're getting most of our clients. I think our goal is to serve 150 people in the fiscal year that we start in October in the work I do which I, I always have to remind myself, like we're not a huge city, we're just at a conference in Milwaukee, we're not Chicago, we're not Milwaukee. For the size of Madison, we actually resettle a good amount of um, refugees in our city, and I think Madison has over, overall been a welcoming place. Um, so, you know, it it's, might not sound like a big number, but it's a decent size for the size of our, our city. So, this is just, sorry, I don't know where I'm pointing. <laughs> Um, and then just a little background. So the ultimate goal of any U.S. resettlement agency is to get our clients self-sufficient in the shortest amount of time possible. That is the way that they're going to be happiest. I mean, we, our services are great, but they're limited. We can't continue them for years and years. So, you know, education is a big part of this, learning English to get our clients self-sufficient. So even though our clients have been through a lot and deserve compassion, they are very, very resilient. They're very resourceful. They're not helpless. So we often remind community members about this. Um, and I just think it's important to understand a little bit of what we do. So I used to be a caseworker. I was uh, part of the reception and placement team. So I worked with the first three months. So I would like pick clients up at the airport at all hours, take them to their first home here, um, make sure they have a culturally appropriate meal. It was, it was very exciting. Uh, and now I'm, I have a different role. But so the things we do, get housing for our clients, we pay for, you know, with federal funds for the first four months and security deposit, food and a warm meal, seasonally appropriate clothing, we teach them about US laws, help with social security, we provide cultural orientation, school enrollment and ESL enrollment through Literacy Network. And we link them to Dane County Employment Services and ongoing social services. So in some capacity, our clients can work with us for up to five years when they're eligible for citizenship in different ways. So we have different programs depending on where they're at in the resettlement process. Okay, so I did already share some of this, but we received about 200 Afghan guests from the safe havens in Wisconsin, and we resettled, and that was just in the past year. We've had Afghan, uh, you know, people from Afghanistan come in years before, but I'm just talking about since last year, August, and we resettled about 80 Afghans. 
Um, one thing that's really important is that in refugee resettlement, it is really crucial to try to resettle people where there's some sort of community that they're already a part of, or a relative, or a friend living in that city. So it's called the U.S. tie. That's often how we get certain people to certain cities. The Afghan crisis was a little bit interesting with this. We got a lot of people straight from Fort McCoy who had um, kids with severe medical issues that needed to be seen at American Family Children's Hospital. So we have families here that had no U.S. tie, no one from where they were from in Afghanistan. So a little, a little bit more complicated for these families to navigate being in a new city. At what point does it get decided where people are going and how yeah. does that? Okay, great question. Yeah. yeah, so um, we operate through one of the nine national resettlement agencies. I'm happy you asked this. Um, HIAS is the one that Jewish Social Services is under. There's Catholic Charities, there's World Relief, there's a bunch of them. So they all kind of work together and I am so like down this process, but I know that we will get a case assigned to us um, from HIAS and we have the ability to either assure it or not assure it and we look at things like Do we just so we just got a case? I forget what country, but like we know there's no one in Madison that speaks this language like it's not going to be successful I'm trying to remember I'm Trying to remember what the, where they were from, but so we have the opportunity I think when people start filling out their paperwork They try to link up with like family or friends that they might know already in the US but what happens is sometimes Madison will get someone and will be like, okay, they don't have a US tie. We're not really sure. Like, we don't even know how they got allocated to Madison. But Milwaukee has a bunch of people from that country that will speak their language. We think they'd be more successful there. So we have a little bit of say, kind of. We'd love to assure all people. We also have a policy that has been a little bit flexible with all the Afghan families we've had, but we don't really resettle families ideally of more than six because in Madison, housing is very, very, very hard. Affordable housing for large families is nearly impossible. So once we start stop paying those first four months, we want them to be able to keep paying. So things like that, does that answer a little bit? So I guess really like we don't even know all the time how people, it happens so, so high up, but we do have the ability to be like, this will be maybe successful, this doesn't sound like it will be successful, you know, maybe think of a different city, so a little bit like that. And then once we have the U.S. tie, we get their information, we call them, they either confirm or deny that they know that person, they are willing to help them in some capacity, and we move forward. So case managers help with school enrollment. I did this a lot last year. I was enrolling kids in MMSD, um, Verona, Middleton Cross Plains districts, districts that we have actually never really worked with in our agency. Like it was all MMSC, and then we had clients going everywhere for, from our Afghan families. So most of our clients speak Pashto. We have a couple that speak Dari, and this language is really unfamiliar to most of the US, including schools, everyone. Um, and also, a lot of our Afghan clients are not literate in their own language, so Google Translate is not an option there. It's complicated. We're trying to run an Afghan women's group right now at my agency, and we're trying to find a Pashto English female you know, who speaks about languages, and it's like, we don't actually know if that exists in Madison. So far, we haven't found anyone. If you know anyone, let me know. <laughs> um, so, and there are a lot of cultural considerations here. A lot of um, our children that we work with have not been educated necessarily. Girls were not, as you know, often going to school um, in Afghanistan, so, Big shock here, um, some of the families. I didn't come across this very much, but I've heard of it in other places, like parents being really resistant to sending their girls to school, but legally you have to here, so some things around that um, have come up before. I also want to mention really quickly, the first Afghans that we helped settle in, at JSS, or maybe even LSS helped in the back in the day, Lutheran Social Services, like many years ago, were from very rural villages, so off, like because of the U.S. tie and trying to resettle people where they already have some tie, a lot of our Afghans were more from the villages, less from the city. So I had a friend doing resettlement in Florida, and they were getting a lot of like um, doctors and nurses from Kabul, from the city, who were very literate in their language, had been educated, just kind of based on the first group of people we've had in Madison years ago, 
we were just have we have different a different group here, and not everyone, but most people were from villages and not not literate. So like some extra uh, extra challenges. And I have a question. Uh, yeah. Do you work with other towns? Like if you send like a couple families in a small town, do you talk to the people of that community before you send the people that they are ready to welcome them? Yeah. Instead of you know. <laughs> Well, do you mean like like Janesville, for example? Right? Yeah. Okay. So exactly. we have you prepare that town. So usually, if someone is sent to a small town, it's because they have a U.S. tie or a family member there, and we kind of like talk to that person about there may be some more challenges that you're going to face, transportation, and all the things, job search. So yeah. Like if they go to the supermarket, they don't want to be all like, well, like, who are you? No. And I'm like, oh yeah, these are the people that we were uh, told that they were coming and kind of say hi or say something, like kind of prepare yeah. well, everybody to welcome. Yeah, you mean in the community. Is, like the, the community, I think is extremely Yes, important. and we think about this a lot in Madison for sure. And Madison is pretty welcoming, but when people end up in some of these rural communities, and I don't even know how, to be honest, that that happens, because we don't work with them if they're outside of kind of, we do have a client in Janesville that we're actually working with, not from Afghanistan, but he had a relative there. So I don't know exactly what goes on in some, but most people kind of end up in a city, well, not everyone. You may be thinking of someone, a family you know or something, but yeah, it can be interesting. Especially the Hispanic community, that's, um Sometimes they like end up hard time. Yeah, definitely, and that is hard. So I worked with a lot of ELL, ESL teachers, social workers. Um, I was pretty involved with the schools, and I was really happy about that because I got to hear all the great work the schools were doing with not just our Afghan clients, but lots of our clients. Um, and because of the Afghan crisis and the publicity, obviously that it received, people wanted help. Like, everyone wanted to know, what can we do, what can we do, what can we do? So some of the challenges that I, I actually interviewed some of the social workers and teachers I got to know a little bit better, process, uh, language barrier, communicating to families, keeping kids engaged and involved in school and extra activities, and the important considerations, prayer time and nutrition. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, okay, so. Some educators shared with me, and I didn't even know that this was like in within the job responsibility of people that held these jobs. I think during the Afghan resettlement process, lots of us were doing things that were not within our job responsibilities because it was intense and we all wanted to help. But I was hearing social workers are picking kids up. Like they had a doctor's appointment, they had a volunteer driver. We work with Open Doors for Refugees. I don't know if you've ever heard of them. They're an all volunteer run agency. They've been around a while, they're amazing. They do a lot of volunteer driving for our clients. So like let's say someone was taking them to their first medical appointments at GHC and they're getting home at noon. But like then we don't have anyone to take them to the rest of the school day because they don't have cars yet and a driver's license. Like social workers are telling me they're picking up these kids from their houses. I was wowed by it. I mean, I just didn't know that this was possible and it was amazing. Um, people in the school systems would often identify, this was advice I got, one point of contact person to work with these families. So oftentimes, um, they were doing a lot of home visits. A lot of the Afghan families are really large, a lot of little kids often, very hard to get the family out um, and into the school to come meet. So they would come go do home visits with the family. And, and one educator told me they were doing like six, six a year with one of the families, which is, that's a lot, like that's a lot of work. Uh, so it was helping to build relationships and trust, and they would often go into the home with something the kids needed anyway, like if they were setting up an internet hotspot, you know, so there was like a purpose of the visit, not just to like communicate, but also like here's a backpack, you know, snow boots if you need them, things like that. Um, wait, one more thing on the home visits. Uh, all, everyone I spoke with mentioned that the Afghan families are so hospitable and they were bringing like tea and bread and, and all these things out and they just had these warm, really lovely visits with the families that we work with and I think that building trust was really, really important for the families and for the schools to be successful. Okay. So, 
Um, oftentimes, I, it was very helpful to have weekly calls with the families. And I just want to say, I know this is a lot of extra work. Like, the schools we were working with were putting in a lot of time to help the Afghan families feel comfortable and be successful. And we appreciate that so much. The families appreciate it. But it doesn't mean it was easy for any, anyone involved in this process. It's been a lot of work. Um, so sometimes they were doing like a weekly meeting. It was often with dad and it would be on the phone. They would use language line to call an interpreter. A lot of schools I worked with had never really even used language line. I mean, they have a lot of like Spanish speakers in, this, in their schools. Uh, some schools had Arabic speakers when we had Arabic speaking students, but no one, no one had any Pashto speakers. So language line and oftentimes the waits to get an interpreter can be kind of long. So they would, they would have that all ready to go and do these weekly calls. And it was the one point of contact, whether it was the social worker or the ELL teacher. And the point was to just be able to tell the family what's going on in the school. Even things like communicating, um, these are, you don't have school this day for conferences. Like, so complicated for these families. Because you can't send even an interpreted flyer home with them. Because they most likely can't read it. Um, so it was, it was challenging. And I, it was great that they did this. Uh, I was once asked by someone, like, how can we best support our students? I'm forgetting, maybe it was, I think Verona had never worked with, we hadn't worked in the Verona district much, or it was Middleton Cross Plains. And I really, one thing I thought was really important was make sure these kids and families know of every opportunity available, especially free and things of transportation, like whether it's after school soccer or things like that. And because so much of that gets missed, like these kids, they don't know about it, the families don't know about it. And it was awesome, it was, um, I think it was Stoner, I forget which school it was, but they made sure that these kids knew about soccer, you know, everyone loves football, it's like the international language of love, that's what I always say. And these kids got, were playing soccer because the school went the extra mile to make sure the families knew about this programming. And there's a ride home, and they can help with, if there was a fee, they could waive it. But that's a lot of extra work on the educators, and I understand that. But that was some advice that I always give, is, is please make sure the students and the families are aware of every opportunity that is available to anyone else who speaks English. Um, so I think that's important. And the school was providing rides, like I mentioned. So, and you know, having interpretation ready to go. Ah, um, okay, this was cool. One educator was telling me they had a newcomer group for new students. And I don't think it was just necessarily for Afghans, it was for kind of anyone who, especially like the non-English speakers, a group that showed where the bathroom was, um, different things like that, where the gym, the cafeteria, and Oftentimes, if there were um, like little kids and then like older siblings or cousins in the school, they would have a time where they could all gather together during the day so they could kind of have that comfort of home or someone to speak their language with. So they had a lot of the bigger kids kind of mentoring the little kids throughout the day. And then special considerations, and of course this is not just necessarily for Afghans, a lot of cultures come with some of this, you know, other special considerations, but prayer time was really, is really important for these kids, some of the kids, and um, the, the feedback I got was the timing can be kind of flexible on it, and, and at the beginning we, they would, you know, the parents would talk with an interpreter with the schools and maybe me involved or a social worker from the school to talk about these things. But it's really, they, the educators talked about how important it is. Don't just throw these times during recess or lunch or the fun things. Those are really important for the kids to also be at. Uh, they don't want them to miss out on social time. But also make sure to set a timer because prayer time would turn into fun time often. Like these kids would, you know, start splashing each other's water. I don't know. They said it would get real silly. So make sure they're called back at some point. Um, Washing was an important part to prayer time, so they had some towels for them in the bathroom. And um, also the halal and dietary restrictions, that was very important for all of our Afghan clients. And I would make sure, um, usually when we did like a little orientation with the students, we'd go to the cafeteria, the schools would show them what kind of foods they could eat. Basically it was vegetarian, nothing with gelatin or meat, we just had them stay away from. And um, the schools did tell me that often the kids were really picky at first, 
and that they would get really concerned, like, are they eating enough? We're worried, we're worried. And then they kind of learned over time, like, the kids are getting fed at home, like, they're okay. If they're picky, don't be too alarmed. And that also they all developed a love for cream cheese and are now buying cream cheese in their houses. That's what I love. They love cream cheese. <laughs> Um, so, I know I only have a couple more minutes to talk and then we'll do questions, but, so that's, that's just my, that's kind of the feedback I got when I spoke with educators about how to help our Afghan clients. A lot of that can apply to all of our clients. We are regularly um, resettling, like every week we're getting people right now from all different countries, Afghanistan, same a lot of DRC, Syria, we get clients every week. Um, so just so you know, we are running some more, we do a great job at JSS of like, if you look at like the Maslow hierarchy needs, like the bottom level, right? Like safety, food, shelter, education, medical care. I think we're really strong there. What we're trying to do now that things have slowed down, it was crazy last year in the summer, fall, a little bit more with mental health. So often, We'll hear from social workers if there's a kid who's really struggling. Uh, we had an app, I'm thinking specifically of some Afghan clients. I mean, these kids have been through a lot of trauma. Um, and we, we talked about it. We kind of helped try to find resources. We have a lot of referral sources we work with for behavioral health, especially people that will provide interpretation. That's not only important, it's actually necessary. Um, so we are running mental health and psychosocial support groups. Right now they're for adults, but a lot of it is on parenting and also like school stuff comes up too. I, so my main role now at JSS, which I really like to talk about, is Algerani. It's a program, a mentorship program between existing Madison community members and clients or families, like a whole family. And I, we actually have someone paired with a, a minor who is here without his immediate family through this program and it's been really cool. So that's something that we provide. Um, and we are, we just started a mental health committee at my organization to kind of figure out where we want to go. And, and I'm bringing this up because it's not just about the adults. We're also thinking about the kids. It's talking about mental health and wellness in different, I mean even in America it can be very hard, but in some of the societies we work with or cultures we work with, there are not words for the terms that we use. There's stigma associated with it, so we're really working on that. I, by nature, most of our clients have been through trauma. I would say all of them have been through trauma, and we wanna make sure that they're supported and, and we can hopefully help get them hooked into the right services, if not through us. And just a little plug, we have a lot of volunteer opportunities at JSS, the Algerani Mentorship Program, which I'm building, is one. Um, I won't go too much into these, but if there's ever big groups that want to help get together and um, help with a move-in or set up an apartment for clients that are coming, um, we have a lot of opportunity for that. And I did put in some resources for educators. I won't click on them, but these three, I don't, have you, has anyone ever seen any of these links? Okay. Um, all three of these have amazing trainings specific to Afghan newcomers and the education system and helping them in school. So I highly recommend you check those out. Again, I think a lot of this stuff is very useful for all of the clients we work with, no matter where they're from, but there were some special considerations with how fast the Afghans came and how unprepared they were. Um, we're also starting to work with the Ukrainians a little bit, and that's a, a, bit, a bit different too, but some of it is similar. So just keeping in mind that the special consideration is usually like, no one was prepared for this. <laughs> uh, no one here, no one over there, and a lot of the resources I think kind of are tailored towards like, you know, this just happened, this is very shocking, what do we do now? And they're great resources for educators. Okay, so that's all. I have planned, and now we have time for questions. Anyone has it? Nothing? <laughs> yes, I'm from Milwaukee. Yeah. Where do I go? To help with? To help, to go for resources. Will those resources help you in Milwaukee? Yes, they will. And I, so on Thursday, we were at a conference in Milwaukee called Our City of Nature.